With, with the advent of commercial space travel, which seems <laughs> seems inevitable. <laughs> <clears throat> Seems inevitable, <laughs> right? And have Virgin Galactic joining Virgin Atlantic as a way to spend your tourism dollars if yeah. you're stupidly rich. But, you know, but the problem is, I think that's all a scam, scam, scam. I, I really do. I think. Love, you, love your segues. Do, yes, okay. don't, don't, do you think that it's possible that maybe you could even offer up a, a flat earth believer tour where you, you take them? Like at the very least, take them up to Alaska where it's light for so, twenty three hours a day. Just calling into you is this? Uh, tweeting me constantly, tweeting really? me constantly. Yeah, calling me a sellout. I'm a sellout. I got a question for you, man. So um, I've been a fan of you for a long time, right? So what made you make the switch from like being a moon landing denier to like? That's a good question. Crazy if we did. You don't think the moon landing is real? No, I don't. No, no. Do you? Yeah. Why do you think the moon landing is real? Why don't you tell me why? I saw it on television. It? Oh, you're a f genius. Oh, beep that. Hit okay, that. we'll bleep it. We'll bleep it. No, it's okay. We got That's it. That's genius. You saw it on TV? That's awesome. I'm going to show you some CGI. I'm going to show you King Kong. I saw that on TV, too. This is an 80-foot gorilla. He's running around kidnapping white chicks. You should check it out. <laughs> 1972 was the last time a human being has been through the Van Allen radiation belt. 1972. That's the last time. There's been only seven trips ever that human beings have ever gone past 400 miles. Every single space station mission, every space shuttle, every satellite, all of those are inside the protective Van Allen radiation belts, which started at 1,000 miles. They go from 1,000 miles to, depending on who you ask, if you ask NASA, 24,000 miles. If you ask James Van Allen, the guy who discovered it, it's 67,000 miles of intense radiation that's in a gigantic donut band that covers around the Earth. Now, even if you got outside of that band, you have to deal with solar cycles. There's the eight Apex of a 20-year solar cycle was between 1969 and 1972. All the time oh when these guys God. are making those missions. Any one of those guys out there in those tiny little aluminum shielded crafts would have been killed instantly during any solar flare. Why fake it? Thank you, Kyle. Why, why, why fake it? Why not fake it? You, you should open with that. You look at the, if you look at any of the footage online, it looks ridiculous. It looks stupid. If you look at the videos, it looks ridiculous and dumb. You know why? Because in 1969, nobody anticipated that we were going to have VCRs and the internet. We were going to be able to watch that. They wanted to win the Cold War. The Go. Soviet Union had over 10 firsts in space. The first man in space, first woman in space, first, they, they had everything, first dog in space, they had uh, first satellite, they, had, they were so much more advanced than the Americans were, but the Americans were more advanced in trickery, and that's what they did, they figured out a way to fake it, that's why when Neil Armstrong got back, first of all he went insane, they went into a deep depression, so did Buzz Aldrin, he became a huge alcoholic, they gave no interviews, Neil Armstrong still to this day will not give interviews, he gave one speech that he gave at the 25th anniversary of the moon landing, and this is what he said, in front of America's best honor students, he said, we have here amongst us America's best and brightest and the quote was you will achieve many great things if you could peel away one of truth's hidden layers that's a speech this guy gives standing in front of the top honor students of the country. not I went to the moon he doesn't say that he gives this cryptic speech now Bill Clinton in page 100 I think it's 156 of his book my life he gives this story about how when he was a kid he was working with this carpenter and this carpenter said you know I don't believe man landed on the moon it was three months after the moon landing and he said I thought that guy was ridiculous he said you know what I don't believe anything those TV fellows show you he said after eight years in the White House I thought maybe that guy was ahead of his time Wow this is in Bill Clinton's autobiography wow. this is in his book there's no way people went on the moon. There's no way. By the it's way, it's impossible today. China wants to go back to the moon. They don't even have a clue how to do it. They're going to try to get there in 2020. America thinks we could possibly go back in 2017. All of the hard data, the telemetry data, 14,000 reels is missing. No one can find it. What the telemetry data that is, amazing? that's the binary that data, amazing? the ones and the zeros to show the distance between the command module and the Earth during every step of the way, on the way to the moon and back, which you can't fake. They don't have that. They can't find it, which you would think would be in a locked golden vault the Smithsonian. But no, they can't find it. Well, they say, well, you know, they, they placed laser reflectors on the moon. You can shoot a laser beam. That's proof. Well, it's not proof because the Russians did it twice with unmanned probes. The Russians also collected space samples and samples of the moon. Very amazing, and I've had these guys on. And Which I've guys? Seen, I've, 
you know, the different guys on the Internet that are behind. There's the, a lot uh, of guys, and I, yeah. I've debated that one guy, yeah. that Phil Plate from Battlestar. I clown that guy. The guy that gets in every astronaut's face. Well, that guy's crazy Christian, and he's nuts. Which is, you know what, you have to be a little crazy but, to look that deep into this theory, because wait. it seems so Joe. solid. We went Joe. to the moon. It seems so solid Joe. until you look into it. But here's the only thing. We can't what? keep anything quiet in this country. It doesn't matter. No one's keeping it quiet. Everybody you can go NASA, look at it. The astronauts. I mean, Those who, guys are afraid of their lives. Gus Grisham, the pilot who was the guy who died on the launch pad along with two of his friends, he was a public critic of NASA. He put a lemon, he hung it on the simulator, put a lemon and put it on a hanger and hung it. He was dead in that same that same cockpit. He died like two weeks later. They, he burned to death inside of that. They were, they were terrified. This is a matter of life and death. These guys were in the middle of a huge cold war between Russia and they wanted to show that America had technological superiority. The race to the moon, the moon lane, all that stuff is not about going to the moon and collecting things. It's about m military superiority. It's about the ability to do things with military technology. All that stuff they use for NASA, all the stuff they use for the stealth bomber, the space shuttle, all those missions, that's not for... It's not for philanthropy missions. That's that's to fuel the military industrial complex. The machine behind this is all the military. And getting to the moon first is making a statement that we have military technological superiority over Russia. And that's what they did. You were totally down for you were the moon hoax crusader. <laughs> something. No, 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 no. Listen, listen, man. Uh, here's my issue. My issue is how can I even argue it? How is it possible that I even have points? Joe, How is it possible that anybody Joe, let's have go any to the points? moon. You see, hey, you see Donald Breezy Donald right there? Time, he took dude. fucking all this shit. I hope someone did go to the moon. I hope someone did. I really do. I don't know if they did. And you know, no. If somebody reputable starts talking about UFOs, you can co-opt the person and say, hey, want to know UFOs? We'll show you the real deal. But not only can you never talk about it publicly, you have to be a debunker publicly. I'll tell the government right now, tell you right now if you're listening, NSACI, I'm available, okay? If you show me all the real wreckage, I swear to God, I will make fun of that crap to the end of time. I'll make up stories. I'll, I'll lie to my mother. I don't care. You show me a UFO, I'll lie to my mother. I swear to God, I will make fun of that crap to the end of time. I'll make up stories. I'll, I'll lie to my mother. I don't care. You show me a UFO, I'll lie to my mother. I'm really? a round earth sellout. Like as if there's a, some round earth money. Wow. Yeah, like yeah, some, you're on the payroll. I'm getting some checks. <laughs> I'm getting some round earth checks you're, you're to getting, keep- I swear to God, I will make fun of that crap to the end of time. Some the payola, some going. round earth payola for your show. I'm sure you've seen the basketball player who graduated from Duke. From Duke. Duke. That was hitting the news the last couple of days. And I saw he believes that. that dinosaurs are fake mm -hmm. and that the world is flat. Okay, so here's the thing, Joe. Okay? Here, here, I've thought about this. I bet you have. As, <laughs> as, as an educator. <laughs>
holding aside the fact that I'm a little scared that in this 21st century United States of America, we have people walking among us afraid of the number 13. What does that mean? I don't know in the long run. But if you keep to yourself, don't harm others, think whatever you want. So that the rubber hits the road is you now have power over others. And that's where the failure of the educational system actually manifests. Now, when you get in a debate with a guy like that, I don't debate B.O.B. People. guy. I, I don't debate people. Okay. Well, when you discuss, Because as the saying educate, goes, when an right. argument lasts more than five minutes, both sides are wrong. Well, that's a terrible saying. It's yeah, definitely it's, it's mostly somewhat right. wrong. And the other person's stubborn. You know, it could definitely last for hours. Yeah. yeah. That's, <laughs> that's not true it's, at all. It's not. It's true 80% of the time. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Um, but you got into it with that rapper that thinks that the- so Here's- I'll tell you why, B.O.B. Because- yeah. In his Twitter stream, he was saying he was invoking physics. Mm. And so I said, I got I to gotta deal with this. Right. Yeah, and so he in. showed a picture from Bear Mountain, which is a mountain in, in slightly upstate New York, mm -hmm. where Manhattan is in the sight line of the summit of this mountain. And he says, given the curvature of the earth and this formula, you should not be able to see Manhattan at all. Okay. Um, it, and... It depends on the height that you're viewing. Well, it from. thank you. Well, well. So, so you you do the math, and it turns out, Manhattan, the island, would not be visible at all. That's true. But any building taller than 15 stories would rise up above the curvature of the Earth, and you will see it. And if you look at the photo, you see the tall buildings rising above 15 stories. It's exactly what the correct formula shows, and not his formula, which was wrong and misinterpreted. Uh, claims to show. I'm doing one more video or one more time lapse. Huh. I wanted to show that my camera is damn near in the water. And not only that, but it's on the lowest setting. I can spider this thing out to where it sets real low. It's like two feet above the water right now. Actually, it's like 21 inches, but I'll give it two feet, being that it's not quite all the way in the water. lights are uh, like I said uh, the first one there on, on the left is uh, 3.5 miles um, the one in the middle is um, you know 7.5 to 8 miles away and the one to the right is 11 miles um, and you know this is why I say you know you, you need to have the proper lighting everything needs to be right um, you know the the air is dry I don't have all that humidity causing the distortion, causing the miraging and the mirroring.
it's just bizarre because snipers have been using the, the, the literal curve of the earth to plan where bullets go. That's if how they want it that precise. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you have to when you shoot yeah. at a mile. Yeah. You know, when you're shooting like well out over a thousand yards, those those factors. All right, one of the things that pops up in every one of our long range rifle classes is Coriolis effect and spin drift. Okay, um, it's in every ballistic program. It's out there. It's in some manuals, and it's theory. Okay, here's where I'm coming from. I was on several um, long range rifle and, and, and sniping type web pages where there's interaction between the folks that are on them. And a question came up from a kid that was a brand new army sniper. He was getting ready to go to sniper school and he was worried about how he was going to pass this course. So of course he put it out there to any army snipers. Hey, what am I going to get to go through? What do I need to work on? And one of the answers he got really pissed me off. It was, you need to worry about Coriolis and Spindrift more than anything else. Now, Given the plethora of ever other information, mathematical equations on range estimation, sight alignment, sight picture, breathing, trigger control, follow through, prepper for, prepper for the next shot, all these things result in quality accuracy down range if you do them properly. Coriolis and spin drift are theory, okay? Whether you want to agree to this or not, it's somebody's mathematical theory. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you have to when you shoot yeah. at a mile. So as the bullet leaves the, the barrel of the gun, the earth is still rotating and the bullet is not rotating with the earth. So the earth will actually rotate out from underneath of the bullet while it is in flight. Whether you want to agree to this or not, it's somebody's mathematical theory. We are all moving with the earth at 800 miles an hour. So as the bullet leaves the, the barrel of the gun, the earth is still rotating and the bullet is not rotating with the earth. We are all moving with the earth Oh, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, you have to when you shoot yeah. at a mile. You apply the fundamentals of marksmanship properly, crosshairs where they need to be, do the right dope on the gun, fire the shot effectively, you're going to get a good hit on, on target. We're back to the errors involved at the ranges again. We'll use 500. Does it matter if you are one and a half inches left or right of your aim point, in this case, at 500 yards? Absolutely not. Still a killing shot. At 1,000 yards, 10 inches may have an effect, but I'm back to the wind again. Is it not you calling a bad wind call or is it spin drift? We don't know. Now, the problem with the standard theory and Rod's theory or Storm Mountain's theory is we can't test either side of the coin. We basically need a 1,000 yard indoor range with 100% no wind conditions inside that to prove this fact or theory, I should say. It's not available to my knowledge. I, have, I know of no indoor range with no wind conditions in the country or the world and I've shot on a bunch of ranges. For that matter, I say apply the fundamentals of marksmanship, dial in your wind properly, which is the big issue, shoot your shot, and adjust off of that. Thanks very much. Remember to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Check us out at stormmountain.com or smtc.us. We look forward to seeing you in long gun courses in the future. Take care. So the earth will actually rotate out from underneath of the bullet while it is in flight. I'm not gonna talk about how this guy did the red bull jump and somehow the earth didn't rotate out from under him i'm going to talk about something that i know about i was in the military in a range of battalion in a long range reconnaissance surveillance unit went to various schools and i've done my share of shooting a lot of different weapons and i went to a lot of different schools explaining target acquisition even after my military service i continue to be a firearm enthusiast and I reload my own ammunition which means I have a very good understanding of internal ballistics and also when it comes to in the field I can use my reticles and calculate yardage and calculate compensation and compensate for the wind quite well I know how to use a reticle to determine yardage and use that to hit a target in high wind and at 500 yards, I can yield a target like this pretty consistently. But here's a drill I want to do to obviate the problem with what they teach about the Coriolis effect. I picked Singapore because it's on the equator. And we know that on the equator, the Earth is spinning at about 1,000 miles an hour. There are a few equatorial cities, but this is a good one because it's also on the water. It, there happens to be a lighthouse in Singapore also, which makes an excellent stationary target. This is called the Marina Lighthouse in, in Singapore within one degree of the equator. 
So let's bring in the shooter who's going to hit this target. Meet Mr. New Jersey. This is one of the biggest battleships ever made. It has a 16-inch gun that can reach 25 miles. I've seen specs that say up to 28 miles, depending on the, the ammunition. But here's a quick snip of some proof. They're saying that that bullet actually goes almost 2,700 feet per second. And here they claim 24 miles. I've seen different ones. The weight of that bullet is a ton. Here's a picture of an old decommissioned barrel with a mock projectile to give you an idea of the size of this gun. Because this is what we're going to hypothetically set up as a scenario to hit that lighthouse. Here's one of the projectiles in the magazine tube where it would feed up to the gun. And once it gets up there, they pack hundreds of pounds of powder behind that bullet. It's one of the more impressive guns anyone could ever see fired. When they pull the trigger, the the explosion is so enormous that it sounds like it's the end of the world. It, when you see them fire them off from the air, you can see the decompression of that barrel gas make a shockwave across the water the size of a football field. So you aim at your lighthouse 25 miles away, you pull the trigger, boom, it should fall to the ground, right? Well, not exactly. We got a couple problems with this, and let's use math. 25 mile target from the New Jersey has a flight time of 90 seconds. So you're aiming 90 degrees from the ship straight to the equator to hit that lighthouse. And it takes 90 seconds for the bullet to get there. Problem is in 90 seconds at the equator, the earth moves 25 miles. So it takes 90 seconds for the bullet to get from the ship to the lighthouse. But in that 90 seconds, the lighthouse moves 25 miles. So you're going to miss it by 25 miles. Now, those are nice numbers to work with because it sets up a triangle. And you can do a little math to go, well, could I actually lead the target and compensate for the Earth spinning underneath of it like they say you have to? Well, how far is it? A squared plus B squared equals C squared, which will give you the distance of the hypotenuse you would have to use to lead the target at a 45 degree angle and you'll find that you couldn't hit that target because it ends up being a 33 mile hypotenuse. So you're gonna shoot a lighthouse. The ship and the lighthouse move. Even if you tried to lead the target, you're gonna fall eight miles short because the range of the gun is only 25 miles. Think about that people. I don't think that this ship misses targets. I don't think it's 25 miles off when it shoots at a target 25 miles away. You have to use your brain and just think about some of these things that obviate that they're full of crap. They show you full cult pendulums and say everything moves independently underneath of an object, but then they tell you this guy floated around for hours above the earth and jumped in the same place he took off from. You have to analyze and think on your own, and you just tell me if this makes sense to you because... It makes a lot of sense to me. Hope you have a great day. No, no. The one on the left has to be an illusion. But I think we can shoot the boat on the right. The curvature chart says it's okay. Yep, there's a kitty hawk. Certainly not that one. That's a refracted image of a boat that's hidden below 50 feet of water. The stupid flat earthers actually think that's a boat there. No, the same with that one. Don't shoot, that's a mirage. Ooh, that's a tough one. Do you half refraction, half real? So aim for the top half of the boat. Not that one, that's refraction. There's no boat there. You're aiming at a wall of water. You should see Sewell coming up pretty soon, right? Uh, yes, yes. Finally, the curvature chart says that one is okay to shoot. Just keep cycling through. Absolutely not. It's actually hidden behind something like 40 feet of water. Yeah, there's a scope. Yeah, this is hard. Adjusting. Nope. Why in the hell did we even install a periscope? It's not like it's useful for any boat beyond a few miles. Thank you.
So let me think. A mile, I have to ask, how much cur curvature of the Earth do you get after a mile? It's an well, you also get drop. Question. You get drop and curvature. Well, that would be gravity drop. Yes. And then curve. Yeah, so both of those. Yeah. 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 Well, there's a good – well, it's here, here's the thing to say someone. If you uh, have a bullet in your hand and you shoot a gun, uh, which bullet drops moment. faster? Right. They, yeah, they generally they get the wrong answer to that. Yeah, they yeah. drop at the exact same rate. They'll hit the ground at the same time. Exact same time. And that that blows people's minds. They right. can't believe that's But you fact. do that if But that's not all. This video continues to insult our intelligence completely. Do they actually expect us to believe these two clips represent a single uniform event? They try anyway. See for yourself. How do we go from one feather to a group of feathers? Unless the magic of gravity has the ability to add feathers. <laughs> Just like the non-vacuum footage, you never see any uncut vacuum test footage either. It's always these three clips you see here. You start with one feather, as we discussed, then it cuts to some blurry, long-range shot of the feather cluster and then the ball group falling together, and then they cut again to the landing perfectly on the box. If they want close-ups and whatnot, that's fine, but at least one real-time continuous shot of the whole event from beginning to end should have been included. What do they've got to hide, right? I can't believe that's but you do that. And don't things expand in a vacuum, too? Just saying. <laughs> Well, of course I had to check out the other footage. It wouldn't be fair to just examine the most popular and publicized video. The reason I said that maybe our actor crew was watching the feathers beat the ball to the ground was because that's exactly what I saw over and over again when I slowed down the other videos of this type of experiment. The other videos varied a lot in their presentation style, and some used tubes while others used a chamber. But in all the videos, lighter objects stay ahead of the heavier ones. This particular video was tricky to slow down because it all happens in the blink of an eye, but the feather clearly beats the ball. Again, the feather is actually ahead of the ball when you slow it down and pause. The image quality of this video isn't very good, but you can see that the feather is beating the ball on the first part of it where the whole apparatus is shown. I right. can't believe that's but you do that. And this is my second favorite video before we get to my the next one, which is my first favorite. But this one's my second favorite because both objects are about the same size and shape and because it is more clear than some of the other videos. In this video, again, it seems like they are the same when viewed at regular speed, but they are not. The lighter object is ahead. In this particular video, I like that they've added a third element. None of the others I saw did this. Therefore, this is a better experiment in my book. The clarity of this video is pretty good, too. Even in this video, the feather is now ahead of the heavier ball in vacuum. It seems from my observations of all these videos that a vacuum chamber changes the game to such a degree that feathers actually beat their heavier companions with consistency. I don't understand why this is not addressed. Surely I'm not the only one noticing this, right? I know people often just see what they want to see, but come on people, take a deeper look. It's right there if you just pause the videos. Right. They, yeah, they generally they get the wrong answer to that. Yeah, they yeah. drop at the exact same rate. They'll hit the ground at the same time. Exact same time, and that that blows people's minds. They right. can't believe that. But you fact. do that. If, they right. can't believe that. But you fact. do that. If, <gasps> physics one hundred and one. You know, yeah. we, it's it's an exper It's a physics demo. So that's why physics is so important. You know, people say, oh, let's take biology and this. Great. But don't leave out the physics because that's where the fundamental operations of nature are to be found, of the yeah. physical universe are to be found. So what you have is you have a gun at one side. Uh, it's like a, a thing that shoots out a projectile. I don't want to call it a gun. At one side of the stage. And then you have like a little stuffed animal at the other side. It's held up with an electromagnet at the top of its head. And these two are exactly the same level. As the projectile comes out from the, the this mini cannon, it trips an electric circuit that releases the electromagnet at the top of the stuffed animal. The stuffed animal begins to fall. The bullet moves horizontally, but also falls because gravity is pulling them both. And you watch the projectile curve down, you watch the stuffed animal curve down, and it hits the stuffed animal every single time. <sighs> The only factor that would change that would be if you put wings in the bullet and it was dealing with the wind. <laughs> wings. <laughs> right? Yeah, wind, wind would affect it. Yeah. Uh, do they have...
Given the plethora of ever other information, mathematical equations on range estimation, sight alignment, sight picture, breathing, trigger control, follow through, prepping for, prep for the next shot, all these things result in quality accuracy down range if you do them properly. Coriolis and spin drift are theory, okay? Whether you want to agree to this or not, it's somebody's mathematical theory. Bullets with wings? I haven't seen that. No, they don't. Okay. No, yeah, but wondering. if they did. Yeah. You know, if like you shot the bullet and then they figured out like clink <laughs> and the wings came out. I saw that on some wind. James Bond movie. I Probably. thought. Probably. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 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 It's it's just got to be frustrating for you when these things come back around. Like I, there was no flat Earth theory when I was in high school. So. <laughs> Other hell? things, though. Think about it. When you were in high school, there was much more astrology going on. Oh yeah. The President Reagan. Oh, let's talk uh, about that. Nancy Reagan Is had an astrologer. Uh, so today, you don't see much of it unless it, it, you talk to Steve Maxwell. Well, but it's still there. It's just not. It's not manifesting in public policy. Some people believe in it deeply. I agree, but it's not up there in public policy. That's what right. I'm saying. Okay. Well, we're, Nancy Reagan was really the only one that made it public well, policy. Sure, wasn't but she? then, but at, at the bar, do you do you hear people saying, "What's your sign?" Oh hell yeah! Is that yeah. still a pickup time? Oh hell still? yeah! Hundred percent. No, no, that not be true. Listen, dude, you're married. On Tinder, they're and you, you're I've an been older man. I, I'm out of it. You Excuse don't understand. Me. If you want to get laid, you got to talk nonsense to people. <laughs> I'll make up stories. I'll, I'll lie to my mother. I don't care. You want to get laid, you got to talk nonsense to people. <laughs> got sucked. Well, I'm a Scorpio. <laughs> and if you're a Taurus, we should just stop talking Okay, so I, I missed that. I misled myself. I thought it yeah. was fading. Oh, but just but it's, Nancy it's, Reagan was the big proponent Well, yeah, at the time. I mean, yeah. it's it's nonsense astrology now. It's not like someone who really understands astrological charts and can plot it and the moon's in retrograde and you The pattern of stars that is seen in the sky, how far apart a pair of stars are seen from each other, stays the same over time scales of thousands of years. However, planets move in the sky relative to the pattern of background stars. They change their position in the sky from night to night. The term planet originates from the Greek word for wanderer. The ancient Greeks also recognized two types of stars. Most were fixed and small and moved together. A few were larger and moved haphazardly, or so it seemed. These were planets, and predicting their motion became a centuries-long goal. With just their naked eyes to scan the skies, the Greeks saw only five planets, naming each after their gods, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Saturn, Jupiter. I don't understand. Tell me. Okay, well, the planets move slowly across the night sky, but then they suddenly stop, go backwards, loop around, and yep. then go forwards again. In the second century AD, the Greek astronomer Ptolemy replaced the notion that planets moved on concentric circles and spheres. Ptolemy, like many astronomers before him, sought to explain the irregular motion of the planets. They seem to slow down, stop, and reverse their paths as they move through their orbits. Ptolemy accounted for this complicated motion by breaking it down into its constituent parts. He developed a system where small circles, called epicycles, moved on larger circles. First century astronomer Ptolemy improved on Aristotle by accurately tracing the paths of the planets, which didn't move haphazardly after all. Using complex circular motions called epicycles, Ptolemy could predict their prescribed paths and changing velocities. In other words, Ptolemy's system reliably predicted the future behavior of the planets. The Ptolemaic system was extremely complex. It had all these planets going in loops, and it worked beautifully, but it was just wrong. Copernicus was troubled by Ptolemy's complex heavenly mechanics. Kepler.
Kepler improved on the Copernican system by hypothesizing that the planets traveled not in perfect circles, but in ellipses around the Sun. As planets approach the Sun, they speed up. Further away, they slow down. During the 15th century AD, an idea called heliocentrism claimed the sun, not the earth, was at the center of the universe. This horrified Christian clergy who felt it contradicted the word of God. If God created earth and man in his own image, then earth and its devout inhabitants must be the center of everything. Greatest of all, Galileo plainly saw that Venus went through phases like our moon. Clear evidence that Venus orbits the sun. proof of a sun-centered solar system. It showed for the first time that Copernicus was really right. The Earth wasn't the center of the solar system, the sun was. So Galileo, with his telescope, pushed the Earth away from the center of the universe and said, we're not the center of everything. We're one planet among others. born and you know Celsius is rising and all that crazy crap that they tried I don't know what they're well, doing I was on a talk show I don't know what they're well, doing I, was on a I don't know what they're well, doing I was on a show with an astrologer a real one uh, apparently yeah she she's <laughs> <laughs> a real one or a fake one right How do you she, know? she says she's real okay and I trust her because she talks about how fake other astrologers are oh so she's a hater no, no. <laughs> she's a hater don't trust her and she was saying that the Kennedys all died during a lunar eclipse oh scary and you know that this is a very checkable statement she just says this and everyone's listening and believing and mm -hmm. said wow that's that can't be by accident and well I don't know when other Kennedys died but I know when Jack Kennedy died and it was November 22nd 1963, 1963. so I so I don't need to know if there's an eclipse then I just need to know what phase the moon is in
Right. Because you can only have a lunar eclipse when the moon is full. So the moon was nowhere near full. It was like two weeks away from full. Even if there was an eclipse, it didn't happen during an eclipse, is my point. Right. Okay? So... Of course, because it was daylight. Uh, uh, well, well, no, you can have a lunar eclipse at any time. Oh, okay. Yeah, you can't. Solar, you solar can have eclipses solar eclipses at any time, too. It's just not for you. Dark. It's just oh, not okay, for right. you. It'd be for the Somewhere other side of the earth. The world. Right, right. The, the idea is that the sun, earth, and moon spheres perfectly align like three billiard balls in a row so that the sun's light casts the earth's shadow onto the moon. Unfortunately for heliocentrists, this explanation is rendered completely invalid due to the fact that lunar eclipses have happened and continue to happen regularly when both the sun and moon are still visible together above the horizon. For the sun's light to be casting Earth's shadow onto the moon, the three bodies must be aligned in a straight 180 degree syzygy. The Newtonian hypothesis involves the necessity of the sun, in the case of a lunar eclipse being on the opposite side of a globular Earth, to cast its shadow on the Moon, but, since eclipses of the Moon have taken place with both the Sun and the Moon above the horizon, it follows that it cannot be the shadow of the Earth that eclipses the Moon, and that the theory is a blunder. The Earth. world. Right, right. Don't be so... so centric. <laughs> <laughs> um, in fact, when there's a lunar eclipse, anyone on the side of the Earth that sees the moon will see the, the lunar eclipse. So, And what the model renders, as you can see, you would expect to see a crescent around the actual object itself as it enters into totality, which no one saw or observed in reality. And what I found the most fascinating about this is you get the red split spectrum that appears in the sensors of the cameras, which isn't that unusual. You see refraction and, and uh, lens flaring that kind of splits, splits the image in the red spectrum. But what was fascinating was this thing here, being that it's an inverse image of this side of, of the object coming around and being inverted backwards and being forward projected. So it's being forward projected to you as the observer on the ground to a centralized focal point. So it's this thing, whatever it is, whatever the light's coming through, being refracted and being projected like a lens to you at the ground and appearing in front of you. And you can kind of see if I zoom in a little bit on these, this image. Oops, I'll go back one right there. So this is, this is the actual object being refracted. And there's a whole bunch of little tiny ghost ones in the air. Right, you can kind of see them being split out in the air. And what happened during the eclipse, well, I'll show you how that analyzes actually first. So what I analyzed was I took it to this spectrum gradient to take out some of the red and bring the black forward, right? So I could, you know, wash out all the interfering light patterns to see what I could see. And it renders out to this here. And there's some interesting things in this picture. So here's that object again being forward projected. There is something, a little bit of a, a dot up here that appears to be a physical object of some kind. And then this gradient shows the edge of whatever is causing the eclipse. It cannot be seen. So it's, it's actually not visible. Because when I take it to the other spectrum, like I did with the moon and my control, there's nothing there. Right, absolutely nothing. Except you can see that something is causing the magnetic field, which is you know light light traveling through the field is is photons, and photons have magnetic fields, so you know magnets can bend light as they travel through. They become polarized. And you can see that this is the the focus point, and those little half moons do kind of sort of appear in the gradient, but whatever's causing the eclipse is completely absent. There's nothing there. That that blows people's minds. Right. So basically, nobody saw the moon before, during, or after the eclipse. That's correct. Well, that's so, pretty amazing. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So then the next thing is, okay, well, what's what's causing that, right? And the typical NASA response in their videos online and the mainstream media is that what we're seeing, that blue object, if I go back here, this blue object here, 
is coming down through the atmosphere plane above our heads, through our air and everything else. And it's being forward projected and causing all these little moons on the ground. By the millions. People took thousands of pictures of these. Sometimes, depending on if you were north of the equator or south of the equator, they would appear upside down. Or if you were north of the equator, they appeared the other way. Right? With the crescent facing up and they were being inverted as a shadow. So this is like the the same in, image being rendered as white light on the ground because it's going through the blue into the white and the spectrum change. So then I said, well, how far, where is that actually happening and what's causing it? And I looked at some high altitude footage at 75,000 feet with the 360 camera. And that's what the eclipse looked like at 75,000 feet through a 360 camera. Wow. And there's, there's all those little orbs again. I was like, wow, right? Like literally, wow, and there's the orbs. And you can see that, you know, there could be a little bit of frosting or ice or whatever on the lens camera, but it, it's at altitude, right? So it's cold up there, 75,000 feet. But that doesn't say that that's the cause. What that tells me is the angle of light that's being projected to the lens because you're getting an unequal distribution of light scatter. Some are over here, this one's being illuminated more than this one. This one's a full, full dead on center. So this means the light's coming almost perfectly to the center of the lens as it looks out through the medium. You're getting a really nice rendering of the image. So that tells me a, a, that's a multiple diffraction pattern, right? It's coming from all angles in a, you know, like your perspective, right? Your degrees of your perspective coming at all angles into a center point. So that's multiple diffraction, right? There's no way of getting around that. So this millions of these diffraction angles are now being projected down onto the cat. And it's not just cats, it's dogs too. There's a dog, <laughs> right? So we're gonna be fair. The dogs got it too, yeah. It's raining cats and dogs. Yeah. So. Raining moons on cats and dogs. Raining moons on, on cats and dogs, yeah, exactly. So, you know, we've all kind of, most of us have seen that video where, you know, the it was particularly NASA was trying to explain that, oh, that's just a, a pinhole effect where the light comes through the trees and causes the trees to act like pinhole cameras and you get multiple projections on the ground. Well, being an artist and painter, I mean, that's another one of my hobbies. I do music, art, and paint. I know how pinhole cameras work, right? And what a pinhole camera will do is you can take a pinhole camera light and what it does, it'll actually invert the image, and but it projects the entire field of view, right, through a pinhole, and replicates the entire image, image on a on a back background, right. It is it is true that pinhole cameras will work, but pinhole cameras will not split multiple images into multiple refractions unless it's coming from multiple angles. You see what I mean? You'd have to have a million holes in this in this type of screen or on that mirror, this one's actually being projected through a pinhole and reflected off and bouncing in the room. But you'd have to have millions of holes in it and each image coming from a different angle in order to get multiple images of the same thing from all different angles, like a three-dimensional effect. And that's what that is on the ground, is a three-dimensional scattering. Right? It's coming from all angles, every direction, multiple intensities. So there's no way to say that that is a pinhole camera effect that that blows people's minds if that's actually reality and as light passes through trees right then every crescent moon and every moon phase would come through the trees at night and you would see animals in the forest that look like this right they would adapt right to be camouflaged right you know every bird that flew over the sky as the moonlight came down or the sunlight came down would be projected as a secondary image on the ground and you'd have you know, one bird would appear like an entire flock on the ground and every animal predator be running around chasing ghosts that don't exist, right? So if your mind is going to accept that forward projection thing of NASA and pinhole cameras, I'm just suggesting you think again, right? Can I ask you something, Chris? Is this only happening at the eclipse or does those pictures with the, the shadows of the moon or can that happen at any time or is this just in the eclipse? This is just during the eclipse. See, and that's the that's what makes me ugly is because I think it was time, either time or now this did the NASA video. And it actually says in that NASA video that 
this happens normally all the time. Sunlight or light, this is this is a normal process. Well, that's that's a complete and utter nonsense. It's not a normal process. It only happens during eclipses. Like I said, otherwise the moon would do it every day, right through the forest and the trees, and the sun would do that every day if something passed between it and the you know pinhole camera and a tree, and there was a bird sitting in the tree. Well, then you would see a thousand birds on the ground, right? It doesn't happen, right? And I just it just blows my mind why that is. That that blows people's minds. They so, by the way, lunar eclipses, you get several per year. But so the difference is that the moon would pass in, pass through that cancellation field, you know, every month. But the sun only does it, you know, three, four times a year. Right. So the constant is that there is something that is interfering with the light of both objects. Right. The new moon is essentially a solar eclipse. It happens once a month. Right. right. The phases of the moon is a is a perpetual eclipse that just phases in and out of eclipse phase, right? It just never stops. But the sun only hits that point, you know, four times a year. It's just a different path of the light. So, by the way, lunar eclipses you get several per year. And that that blows people's minds. Hey guys, Paul on the plane here. Just a quick video today, the day after a lunar eclipse on January thirty one, two thousand and eighteen. A Facebook friend of mine, Ron Hagberg, who resides in Florida, captured both video and photographic evidence last night of the lunar eclipse that, in my opinion, blows the globe model of the Earth out of the water. At least the lie we are fed that a lunar eclipse is caused by the Earth's shadow being visible on the moon. Now, we're all told that the phenomenon of a lunar eclipse happens when the sun, the Earth, and the moon are all lined up and the Earth's shadow caused by the sun's light is visible on the moon, so the darkened area we see is supposedly the shadow and the quote-unquote curve of the Earth. But what Mr. Hagberg documented last night, as you can see here, is the alleged shadow of the Earth completely upside, upside down from where it should be on the globe model. If the darkening area of the moon is believed to be the Earth's shadow, then why isn't the shadow appearing on the other side or the bottom of the moon? You can view all of Mr. Hagberg's work on Facebook. He's made it public so all can view it and review it and consider it and share it, etc. The link is in the video's uh, description. He told me this afternoon his video and pictures are going viral and he's been asked by many if they can share it. He graciously allowed me to share them here with you. I have also had other folks send me photos like this one showing me different angles of the shadow, like on the side of the moon here, which also doesn't work in the heliocentric model. There are also numerous accounts on Facebook of folks experiencing the darkening of the moon with the lunar eclipse last night with the sun still uh, visible above the horizon. Don't be so, so centric. Such predictions are impossible to be done using heliocentric model. In its five millennium catalog of solar and lunar eclipses, NASA wrote that all eclipse calculations are by Fred Espenak, a retired NASA's employee. NASA never calculated and predicted eclipses using heliocentric model. They simply hired the best Saros researcher, their retired employee, Fred Espenak, to calculate and predict eclipses using ancient Babylonians method that has nothing to do with heliocentric. NASA even wrote that Fred Espenak is responsible for the accuracy of this 5,000 years catalog of eclipses. For thousands of years, some astronomers collected eclipse cycle all around the world based on Saros cycle. They have started to do this long time before NASA was established in 1958. Astronomers like Fred Espenak simply collected eclipse database from other local astronomers all around the world. As you see in this table, it's made by other astronomer G. Vandenberg in 1955. That's what Fred Espenak did. He is a very good Saros researcher. Why would NASA need Saros cycle if they can calculate eclipses using heliocentric math? Obviously, because they can't. A bunch of mathematical assumptions when combined together to calculate eclipses, they just don't add up. There's an interesting review from Matt Parker from Stand Up Math's channel. He's the only person who got prestigious title as London Mathematical Society popular lecturer, a very smart and articulative mathematician. Here's what he said about predicting eclipses using heliocentric math. 
and so I'm going to show you the mathematics behind how we can predict when they're going to happen. We can do the calculations on the elliptical orbit of the Moon as the Earth goes around the Sun, and we can calculate how often the Moon goes between the Sun and the Earth. Unfortunately, it's not that simple. It is a wonder we have eclipses at all. But then, out of all this chaos, another cosmic coincidence steps forward to save the day. It's called the Saros Cycle, and it allows us to predict when eclipses are going to happen in the reasonably near future. By the way, uh, partial eclipses as a minimum, and every couple of years there's uh, full lunar eclipses. So these are not rare things. Can that happen at any time, or is this just in the eclipse? This is just during the eclipse, See, and that's the that's what makes me ugly, is because okay. to start, they're not rare. Okay, so I said, you know, he he was shot when the I forgot what moon it was, a first quarter moon, and she said, oh well, this counts if they're anywhere within two weeks on either side of the eclipse. What? That's a month. That's a month <laughs> out of twelve. What? It's I said, let me just shut up here and let her keep. It was a. What did she we say? We were sharing the time. Uh, it was uh, Pharrell had a talk show. We were both oh. on Pharrell's talk show. So, and he likes science, by the way. And he he wore a NASA shirt at the at the at the at the the Academy Award um, group photo. The U.S. Space Agency has said our telescopes and the hashtag Oscars trophies are both plated with the same gold. NASA said in a tweet on Sunday. He said that the Oscar trophy is coated in the same gold that helps telescopes glimpse distant galaxies, NASA said. Up here, 260 miles above the Earth, we know a little bit about gravity and the lack of gravity. We took some time from our schedule to watch the movie Gravity here on the space station and was struck by the stunning visuals and stark imagery the movie depicted. Of course, nothing beats the real thing here in space. But we want to congratulate the entire production and directing team and the stars of Gravity for the honors they have earned from the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences in bringing this ultimate in extreme environments to moviegoers around the world. Well done. That's so cool. I got to give him some props for that. But so, but we're, so I just said uh, I'm, I'm, I have nothing more to say here. So I just said uh, I'm, 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 I have nothing more to say here. Hence, my argument for less than less than five minutes. <laughs> never talk about it publicly you have to be a debunker publicly i'll tell the government right now tell you right now if you're listening nsaci i'm available you can co-opt the person and say hey i swear to god i will make fun of that crap to the end of time i'll make up stories i'll i'll lie to my mother i don't care you well that's a terrible saying <laughs> so i said let me just shut up here and let yeah mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm.